Uh, we're hailing here from uh, Treaty 6 territory. My name is Jennifer Don Bishop. I'm the artistic director for the Gordon Tatusis. Oh, wait, did we start yet? <laughs> I'm just going to keep going. Or yeah. Yes, <laughs> I'm going to keep going. This is a first trying to MC live um, from Gordon Tatusis Niganiwan Theater. And I want to welcome our first uh, lecture uh, series speaker, Dakota. Ray Hebert. Hello. Uh, do I just take it away? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, just uh, thank you so much for, for joining us for our first ever and our first ever guest. So yeah. I just want to say thank you. And uh, so today, yeah, you're going to talk about your, a bit of your background, your process for comedy and uh, folk, uh, we have our some of our COV alumni watching too, and so they are welcome to ask you questions uh, in between. Nice, yeah, absolutely, yeah. If um, whoever's watching this too, yeah, feel free to ask some questions, uh, and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, <clears throat> all right, well, hi, my name is Dakota Hubert. Yes, thank you, Jen and GTNT, for having me as part of your summer speaker series. Um, so I've, uh, for those of you who know me, um, you know me as an actor and comedian and kind of just an all around theater, theater nerd, um, and just trying to, oh, oops, turn that off. Um, yeah, just, just, I just try to be in the arts as much as I can. Um, when I was little, I always, I always, I just, I knew I always wanted to be an actor. I always wanted to be an artist. Um, there, when I was little, we, we lived in the trailer park. And so, you know, it's just like one long hallway, essentially. Uh, and I would watch Pocahontas over and over again. And I think it was just like, I was obsessed with the idea that this was my representation. And I know now we know that Pocahontas is not so such a good movie for representation, but um, I was obsessed with it. And I'd, like, I'd reenact that part where she like crawls through the bushes. Like that was a part that I would, I would practice over and over again because I wanted to be perfect. I wanted to be Pocahontas. <clears throat> um, and as I got older, I just kept trying to be like in any of the drama productions or drama after school drama programs my schools would offer. Um, and that's kind of, it was, it was like a secret dream for me, I think. Like I didn't want to tell too many people because I didn't want to get laughed at because not a lot of people from Meadow Lake do that. Not a lot of people, you know, go to pursue a, a, their dreams in the arts or as an actor. Um, and in terms of comedy too, um, my favorite comedians, I, I used to have a Walkman when I was a kid. And so I'd, I'd listen to Bill, Bill Cosby and Jeff Foxworthy. And yeah, half those people are still doing pretty good, but uh, they were really fun storytellers. And so I think that that's kind of how my comedy is as, as well. It's more like, well, yeah, there's their storytelling. Like my comedy's evolved. <clears throat> um, but I, in, uh, in grade nine with the acting, I think I might just should, yeah, do acting first and then comedy. Otherwise it just, it just, it doesn't braid well. It just meshes well, messy, messy. Um, but uh, with acting, uh, it was in grade nine, uh, my teacher, Mr. Krezawadi, he was like the coach of the after school program. And he was also my debate coach, um, but he had pulled me aside and, and he'd said that uh, he really thought that acting was something I could pursue. And, you know, if, if I wanted, he could help me write a letter uh, to get this scholarship for a drama program, a drama camp in the summer. And, and that was really, really, like what I needed, like having a teacher that really believed in me and supported me was really special. And, and so I think like that, that's why whenever I do school tours, I try to let teachers know that their influence is, is really important to students. Um, and then yeah, grade 10, grade 11, grade 12, just did my best. Grade 12, it was like really embarrassing for me because I was like, that's when I, I decided it was no longer going to be a secret. I was going to tell the world I was going to go be an actor. I wanted to, that's, that was my dream. And then I didn't even get cast in our festival play. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And so like, I remember my parents, my family was like, oh, well, I'm a tough luck kid, you know, that's got to suck. And, and I totally did. It was such a big bummer. Um, but I still persevered and I signed up to be a set designer and I won an award for that. So oh, well, nice. <laughs> yeah, I didn't fun. know that about you. I know you're a person of many trades, but I did not know you did that. Yeah, that was it was a little yeah, it was a it was it was a fun award to win. I think I still have it somewhere in my one of my <laughs> time capsules. Um, but then yeah, I, I applied to one university, the U of R, 
uh, I had applied with, uh, I, well, my teachers and my vice principals all said that um, they'd be very surprised if I got rejected. And we were all very surprised. U of R said no for some dang reason. Um, but it worked out for the best because I still just packed up my van and was like, well, then I guess I'm going to go be an actor. And so I went off and went to Regina because I didn't even know about GTNT or SNTC back in the day. I didn't even know, like I knew that there was Persephone here and I, I think I must have known there was SNTC here, but in my head it was Globe Theater. That's what I, that's mm -hmm. what I was trying to go for. So got to Regina um, and uh, I actually, I got two, two roles at Regina Little Theater. They were very awesome and, and helped teach me what theater was like outside of high school, you know, in high school, uh, when you're doing a note session, um, everyone kind of chimes in like, oh, what if you tried this? Or what if you did this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, now we know like in real and real theater, or real theater, um, unless it's like, you know, community-based or what have you, you know what I mean? I'm getting too messy. Um, it's, it's usually the director's job who says, hey, what if you try this this way? You know, it's not really up to the castmates. Um, so I had, <laughs> I was like 18, new to this and like was like giving one of my like older castmates like a veteran actor who's brilliant in her work I was trying giving her a note like hey what if you tried this and like I'll never forget the look this woman gave me but I remember I was like ooh, like kind of chilled a bit mm -hmm. um and then the director pulled me aside was like hey just so you know like outside of high school like the director usually gives the notes and not the people and I was like oh my god I'm so sorry <laughs> um <laughs> But that was, a, that was a learning experience. I learned a lot. And so I, I got two roles from there. And then I decided, you know what? I'm good enough for Globe now. That's it. So I send, sent in, I think I still have the first resume I ever tried to shop around. And I'm, it is like, on one hand, mortifying. And on the other, like, kind of cute. Like, that's what Baby Dakota thought was a resume. Like, it looks awful. And like, it has like my junior high sh plays on it. Like, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I was handing that out. And like these really, I'm sure you've seen it, you know, the, my old headshots where there's like six different images on it. Yes, I have. Yeah. So I was handing those out too. <laughs> 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 to, to professional theaters <laughs> and trying to say like, give me a job, <laughs> you know, I'm ready. I'm professional. Um, so, but Ruth Smiley uh, was incredibly courteous and gracious and uh, she, she saw me for an audition. Um, so I was working at a glass shop, Novus Auto Glass, and on my lunch break, I went over with my sweater and stuff and went and did my audition for them, uh, and then, like, never heard back, and I was so, like, like, so sad, and so, like, mm, oh, like, that, well, there, there, that, there it goes, you know, and I moved mm -hmm. to Edmonton, because I thought, maybe I'll just try to do some film then, and then I got a call, and it was uh, Ruth Smiley asking if I'd like to audition for the Globe Theatre Conservatory program, and I had never thought about going to school for theater. I didn't even know that that was really like, I don't know, I guess where I'm from, that's just not a conducive, I don't know, use of your time or can, can, what's the word I'm looking for? Productive, productive use of your time. I don't know. Uh, that's just like what I had thought, but then um, I had gotten into this conservatory program. I went into the audition and the audition for that was really, really scary. I walked in and I felt like, I just like I didn't belong, like it was, mm -hmm. I, first of all, I was not dressed for the for the auditions. Everyone was in leggings or sweats, like willowy shirts and barefoot. And I had on my Converse sneakers, my Wranglers and my Rough Rider shirt. <laughs> like, <clears throat> I just felt like I, I don't know, I didn't belong at all. Um, and I was really self-conscious and really nervous. And like, it, there was one point in the audition when we were pretending to be blind bears exploring our space. And I was trying to explore as the best as I freaking could in my freaking tight Wranglers. And I was like, I'm not gonna let these Wranglers be the reason why I don't get in the school. Um, and then uh, and then I got in and Ruth finally called me and said, uh, like asked me if I wanted to be one of the 10 spots. And and then she'd already secured some scholarship funding for me. So I had a full ride scholarship in the program. And, and then also, did you know, Dakota, you're the first native student we've ever had in the program. And it was just like, it was a lot to take in like I was mm -hmm. I was so like I don't know yeah like it, it just felt it, it felt like a lot like it still feels like it still is a lot to me like I still totally um credit Ruth for for the career that I have too because like she really took a, a chance on me and saw something in me and I was so thankful for it I'm like getting emotional about this but it's okay it's something <laughs> to be passionate about I mean same here too because you you broke that paveway and then uh like myself 
and another a fellow Aaron Okamason, we had gotten to the same year. So yeah. we were like the one and a half brown people in the program. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. New to the program too. Sorry to say it. Um, and yeah, so it was, it was really, really, yeah, it was really a, a lot to take in. Um, and then well, during the program, I, I felt really subconscious and really like, I don't know, like I know I was probably like fairly aggressive just because like, I think when I was younger, when I didn't know something, I couldn't just say, hey, I don't know what this is. I don't know what this means. I had to just like double down and be like, yeah, I super know what it is. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. That, that youthful stubbornness. So um, I ended up, I think like, I wish I could like redo the program because like the first two months I was just like, like faking it, I felt like, like copying mm -hmm. everyone else, trying to trying to learn through that instead of just being like, what what does it mean to be present? Like, the, like I don't think I understood that until two months after the program. When I was working with SNTC, like, are you present? I'm like, yeah, you're looking at me. I'm right here. And then <laughs> I'm like, oh, like, like mindfully present. <laughs> like, yeah. So uh, that whole program was like a huge, <clears throat> like, growing experience for me as a person and as an artist. It was, it was giant. Um, and then through that experience, they had hired Yvette Nolan, and Yvette Nolan, like, I looked up to. She was like, I like, guess, theater mom to me, a theater auntie, because she really had like, like. Sh I don't know, directed me in, in all avenues of my life, you know, at one point. And so we had met that during that program. And she was like, have you ever heard of like Sass Theater Theater? And I was like, oh, like, I think so. And she was like, you need to let them know you exist. <laughs> like, that's what you need to do. Um, and so so I did. And it turns out they were, they were hiring. Uh, it would have started after just after the program, our program ended. Um, they were hiring for an artist in residence. Um, at uh yeah for for their for the the year and and basically that was going to be helping out the co-coordinator the assistant coordinator for the circle of voices program as well they were just starting up that year so i had applied uh, and i was really nervous that i wouldn't get it because i was already contracted for a show pride and prejudice at global theater as you do mm -hmm. when you do the program um but uh alan long and curtis pd too accepted me in and so that was like okay like i've got work right after school like really I'm I feel like one of the luckiest freaking people in theater um just because of how timing just worked out you know what I mean like mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I got that job and then through that job I got to meet yeah like all the all the amazing like your people like you and, and Aaron Shingus and like just so many amazing like Saskatchewan Saskatoon uh in, indigenous artists and and just through the Saskatoon art scene in general like I was able to meet mm -hmm. Persephone I was able to meet all the, the live five theater folks, you know, and um, it really was just like a whole new world had opened up for me. And I was like, oh my gosh. And you guys were just three hours away from me in Meadow Lake this whole time. <laughs> I got to just come out. Um, so there was that. Uh, but there, there, and then I met, oh yeah, then um, I think that was, that was when we were doing uh, uh, The Hours That Remain by Keith mm -hmm. Barker, which is a, a great play. It makes me ball my eyes out every time. It's so great. And and uh, Andy Morrow was the set designer and the, uh, it was such a beautiful set that was too. And Tara Began was there acting in it and that was awesome. And so I made friends with them. And that was one of the time I was writing my Jack the Ripper play, which is right now. I remember the, that, Jackie yeah. the Ripper, I believe. <laughs> yeah, it was gonna be, yeah. It's like, I was gonna write it off of like, a, like I was gonna make it a black comedy about this woman who just like kept accidentally murdering people. And I was like, yeah, what if it's Jackie the Ripper? Uh, but then it was like, oh no, this is this feels like much more serious. So I, I wrote this horrendously horrendous three act play about Jack the Ripper. Um, God, it's so embarrassing. Um, but so I I was telling Tara Fagan this, um, and she was like, you should apply to Wasagi Chuck, like Native Earths program, uh, the Earth Theater Festival, as and the Anemic Geek program. So mm -hmm. I did. And I got in as a writer and an actor. Oh my gosh, I like lost my mind. That was my first ever time, like, um, like that was my first time being hired as an actor, hired as a writer. Uh, and it was my first time in Toronto. It was my first time taking a plane by myself. Um, and I was out there for two weeks and it was so like awesome. Like I've ever seen like, a, like black squirrels and trying pumpkin beer and seeing all the sights and being on a streetcar. <laughs> I just felt like, <laughs> 
<laughs> it was just like this is crazy town. <laughs> like those are the things that I couldn't get over. Um, <clears throat> and like I didn't, I was too scared to leave my hotel room. I do like I think that would have been more fun and to try more foods. I think that was the first time in my life I'd ever had pad thai because um, I mostly just ate Pizza Hut for the two weeks that I was there. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah, but then through there, I was at, I was then I was at Native Earth in Toronto, and through there, I had made so many friends and met so many people, and I met this uh, young woman, Phelan Johnson. And so, worked with her, we hit it off, we became friends, and uh, she's kind of chatting a bit about her place, Salt Baby, and I was like, oh yeah, no, she didn't even mention that. It wasn't until I think a couple months later. So I, yeah, like time has passed. I'm back home. I'm doing Pride and Prejudice at Globe. That's fun. Um, I'm in fancy, yeah, corsets. Uh, and then after that, I think that's when like we got hired on through SATC to do like the seatbelt tour. Uh, but during that seatbelt tour, I was talking about, I think I was, I don't know, I must have been, I don't know, crap talking my biological mom or something and and just feel, oh yeah, then I was feeling the time because I was around, I don't know more at some point, I'm getting my timelines mixed up, but I felt like I was like having to choose between between sides almost, you know, cause I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm not just Dene, I'm also white. I'm also, you know, French and this and that and the other, I'm a European Muslim Dene in there. So yeah. I remember confiding to Alan Long and saying like, I feel like I'm being pulled in. Like, I feel like I have to pick sides. And he said, you know, you should read Phelan Johnson's play, Salt Baby. Um, so I did, I, I messaged Phelan and I was like, hey, remember me, <laughs> you know, and chatted a bit. And I, I asked if she, if I could read her play uh, and she sent me it and uh, like within the first like seven pages, I was just like, Bleh. this is like almost exactly like my life. Like it was so crazy. And, but just like how the play was written, it's so, it's so well done and it's so funny. And you just, you understand all the characters. It was so like, so great. I just, I wanted to do it. <clears throat> so I applied to Globe Theater's Sandbox series. Mm -hmm and they got accepted so that was yeah like uh, Ben Rowland directing it uh Curtis Beatty Tuss is in that one Nathan Howe and Colin Dingwall and myself and we were we were this ragtag uh, ad hoc group doing Salt Baby um and uh like I mean that's it again like it just goes back to luck like how how lucky I've been in my life because basically after that Pride and Prejudice that's when we applied for Salt Baby then I was doing that summer show or the spring the seatbelt safety show with SNTC yeah Imagination and, Odyssey Imagination Odyssey, yes, uh, and then SNTC hired me on to do what a what a go, what a Mayo go with, the Playhouse series. Uh, uh, um, yeah, it was a drama camp essentially. So that was Zoe Roy and I had be mm -hmm. met and become friends in that. Um, we went around to reserves teaching drama workshops, and then God, like that fall, I was I think that was the fall that I was I had my first big lead dramatic role um, and romantic role doing Tara Bagan's Dreary and Izzy out at Western Canada Theater. Um, and like, after that, I was like, oh, I have nothing booked. Like, I'm not too sure what I've got going on. I know, like, I think in January we're doing Salt Baby. So that's that's something to look forward to. Uh, and then I do this audition over, over Skype uh, for Quest Theater in Calgary. And that's a theater for young audiences company. And they're looking to... Um, to cast for the role of this young Inuit girl and I do the audition and I get it and I'm like oh no freaking way <laughs> so I'm able to it was just like it was it was just crazy how, how lucky it was but uh I know it's luck but it is like also like hard work like I was constantly searching for auditions I was constantly sending out emails and resumes and and headshots like new resumes and new headshots um and constantly like writing down ideas for for pitches or for ideas for like everything like it's just like really um it was I ate I eat sleep and breathe theater is what I was doing and and to some extent like I'm still doing that it's us with theater but now I have like so much more in the air right now um but uh but yeah so that was that was that and then we did Salt Baby and we did Salt Baby kind of all over the place like we did Salt Baby in Regina there in the Sandbox series we did Salt Baby uh, here in Saskatoon at Live Five. We made it. We did a tour of it through the Yukon, uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, and as part of the Talking Stick Festival in Vancouver. And then we graduated to Globe Theater's main stage uh, during the Canada 150 celebration. So I remember I saw both versions: one in the sandbox and then one on the main stage, which was just kind of like. <clears throat> amazing you know because they it just happened not too long ago so for them to bring it you know into the main spotlight you know yeah. and get in the round 
it was yeah it was such a great experience and to see it again oh it was so exciting like I'm still like I'm in love with that show like I keep trying to like right like wrangle up pitches because I just wanted to I, I I think it's a goal of mine it's not even my play like if people could recast me and I'm sure like that will happen someday I hope not but I'm sure it will <laughs> um but I, it's my goal for that play <laughs> for Palin Johnson's play uh to be in every province and territory at least once um because it's so relevant and so uh, important uh, but that also that brings me to uh, like another success we had. So uh, my friend Rebecca Lasky and I co-wrote uh, this like silly, cheesy, happy-go-lucky, fun play, Conrad Roy, uh, and that was that was first premiered on the uh, the Shumi Atcher Sandbox series. And wait, are we allowed to say anything or no? Probably wait. Oh wait, okay. Uh, and I just caught wind that um, I'll be uh, be able to uh, do do that somewhere else. So. Um, yes, I'm excited <laughs> to um, to write more though to get more plays out there. We did Native Studies 101. Yes, uh, that was with the other some COV here uh, that were a part of it, and I'm very excited for. Um, I was very excited for them because working with them in that in that capacity too. That was the first time I had been commissioned as a writer, and the first my first time directing as well. Um, and it, it's just really special being with GTNT. Um, because yeah everyone's so nurturing there and understanding and welcoming and uh supportive and that's that's like that's really important for a theater company to have you know especially when you're doing something mm -hmm. like really special so yeah uh, well, and I remember that the kids the students had such a great time with you and I thought it was super brave when you asked like can I direct I'm like okay <laughs> yeah I, I really felt like I was ready and like I felt like just because I knew I knew the students the, the youth uh, really well too at that point from having worked with them and, and developing the play and, the, and structuring it for them that at that point I felt like having like a new director in there to kind of like it just would have I think maybe it would, it would have been a tough start a cold start at first you know but at least this way we were able to hop right in and then I was able to be like yeah you know what you're right scratch that out move on you know like I was able to kind of wear both hats at once uh, so that was that was really um that was really I don't know it was a really fun experience and it was like I was nervous too but it was so well received like by the community by the youth by like I was just I was so proud of them and like watching them grow out of their shells too I, like I can see why directors love directing right like it really is exciting you're putting this world together and you're in and I don't know it's 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 a lot of responsibility but it was a lot of fun to do that creative work um and so that's kind of why, like, that. I think that's one of my, my most recent theater projects, too. Um, I've been trying to, yeah, like, get more into theater, too. Uh, I just find, like, I must have, I must have been on the road for, like, I felt like five or six years, though. I was constantly on the road. I was really, because of being lucky, um, I was always gone. I was always working, but never in Saskatchewan, it, it felt like. Like, the odd times I would, but that was probably, like, one contract or so a year, Mm -hmm. uh, but the rest were, were taking me all over the place, which I absolutely loved. Like when I when I wasn't married and I didn't have dogs and I didn't have to pay rent. Like I I really I was I was like I was homeless, not streets homeless, but I was homeless in the sense of like I didn't I didn't need a home. Um, everything fit in my car, or I left it at my parents. And I packed up my suitcases and I hit the road. Um, but it took me. I went. I've I've gone across Canada. I think two or three times now with productions. Um, there was one company through the Red Sky Performance. We did this beautiful play called Mr. Tim. We went across the country. Uh, we went across the country and we went across the states. So I've been I performed in eight states. Um, and the other one was uh, a Mary Walsh show for Canada 150. Mary Walsh uh, had written part of it and directed it uh, along with many other incredibly talented Canadian writers. Um, the Canada It's Complicated show and that one went direct like uh, completely across the country too. We started in Newfoundland. And ended in the Yukon, <clears throat> and uh, the only place that I still have to hit in Canada, though, is Northwest Territories. I still have not made it to the Northwest Territories, and it's killing me. Um, <laughs> but we did that, and then I, uh, with with Red Skies, Mr. Tim, we went to China oh, for wow. three for three days. We went to Shenzhen, China, for three days. I did two forty-five minute performances, and then it was time to go home. <laughs> <laughs> and I like I do kind of kick myself for not staying a bit longer when my one castmate just asked to have his ticket changed for a bit later 
but I was just coming off a three month tour where I hadn't seen my partner and I haven't been home. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, like, I know if I had to stay a bit longer, like I'm just going to be homesick and sad. Like I'm not even going to enjoy it out here. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, so, but that was, but that was fun. And, uh, like I, and then with, yeah, with comedy too, like act, well, acting for film is something that I've been trying to get into. Um, and, uh, I hadn't, I had a, I was this close to being a Mohawk girls. If you know me, you know that I love Mohawk girls. It's on ABTN. You can stream it. It's on CBC now too, actually. Um, but I was obsessed with it. My auntie Tennille and I were like obsessed with it. every Tuesday I'd bike over, like drive over to her house and we'd have wings and watch Mohawk girls. Um, and, uh, when I was doing a show out in Ontario, we had, we had stopped, we were in Peterborough, I think. And then I saw Mohawk Crow's casting call and it was like, would you like to be a background uh, actor? Uh, if, if so, you need to uh, come to Ganawage tonight at this time. <clears throat> and I was like, okay, 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 okay. If I rent a car and start driving, like as soon as we're done, I, I think I can make it there on time. And so my caskets were like, what are you doing? Like, go, go then. So I was trying to go. I was trying to go, but at the time I, I was 22, I was 22 years old. Uh, so the rental car companies in Ontario are like, no, we can't rent to you because you have to be 25. And I'm like, please, please, please. I've been driving since I was like 17. Like, like come on. Like it's been, I'm ready. I can drive. Um, and, uh, or driving since I was 15, I guess, but like on my own, since I was 17. <clears throat> so there was one company who was on hold with his risk management team or whatever. And I'm just like, I'm going to be late. Like I, I didn't need a yay or nay, or I'll take my business down the road. Um, and this guy finally was like, ah, all right. And like hung up and he was like, Hey, but you need to promise me that you're not going to wreck the car. And I'm like, I promise I'm not gonna and like, and I did it. So that's great. But I hauled my butt all the way over to Ganawagi, Quebec. Um, which was exciting because I was like, ooh, the stop signs don't say stop. They see it. They say like, I read. I don't have the accent. I read. <laughs> so, I'm like, this is fancy. I'm in fancy Canada. Um, and uh, yeah, we got to drive through Montreal and uh, and then got to meet uh, Roxanne Whitebean, who is a terrific uh, filmmaker uh, from out east. And she was like, yeah, actually, you know what? Like, because you're an actor right you're not just you just don't want to be background you want to be a speaking role and I'm like I would die for a speaking role in Mohawk Girls uh so I gave her my information I think I actually just gave her like a whole USB I was like just take it you know mm -hmm. um and uh and then I got a call back and at this time I think we, I was lucky enough to be in Ottawa so it was like a two and a half drive instead of seven <laughs> or whatever it was um and uh got a call back to Ottawa uh, for the speaking thing in Mohawk Girls. And I thought I bombed so badly that I cried like the whole way back from <laughs> Montreal to Ottawa. Yeah. Uh, and then they called me and said, yes, we want you for this role. And then they said, are you available for these dates? And I was not available for those dates. Oh no. <laughs> no. So I had to like, while I was like cheering out there too, I was like, I have to respectfully, politely decline this opportunity. <laughs> it was so hard. Because I still, it just interfered with one of my one of our theater dates, and I I just couldn't yeah, to do that. So that was that was pretty silly. But ever since then, I've kind of been getting towards more TV and film. And like, I was thinking about that the other day too. Like, why? Like, what? What my goal? Why my goals have changed? So when I was first doing acting, uh, when I was twenty, yes, twenty. And I was doing Pride and Prejudice. We were working with some of Canada's finest actors. Like I think like Michael Hanrahan was there, Kelly Fox was there, like Colin Smith or Colin mm -hmm. Smith. I'm thinking, yeah, Colin, Gordon Smith. I'm thinking Mr. Collins. Um, like there was, and then it was just, it was so awesome to learn from these amazing actors. And Kelly, at one point we were, uh, had her for coffee and she was, she had said like, you'll notice that your goals do change uh, in the arts, you know, and 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 that's just what happens and i remember thinking like how is it ever going to change i'm just trying to become rich and filthy famous rich and filthy famous and filthy rich that's what i'm trying to become that's what i want to be um but then like yeah as you get older like you find your goals do shift like mm -hmm. i really if i had a choice i think i'd rather be like a uh, a writer a really famous writer because then at least like you have money and people don't know what you look like <laughs> you have privacy <laughs> you know what i mean yeah if I could be choosy as such. Um, but also I find like I'm getting more so for TV and film because of the representation. There's still not a lot of 
like indigenous representation on any of the major networks. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something like we have, we have, we have to be in the writers rooms and we have to be like dictating the creation work of indigenous stories, you know, or making sure that it happens properly because we're still, we're still not there yet. You know what I mean? And, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I want us to be, cause I, I think, I think we're deserving of, <laughs> of network time and, and of Netflix time and of our own, you know, stuff. So I'm really excited for that. And actually like, I just recently, yeah, wrapped uh, um, my first feature length uh, last fall. And today I was actually doing some ADR, which I don't know the, what that stands for. Get that Netflix money, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> working towards it, working towards it. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, so I actually just did some ADR, which is like, like you're in a sound booth recording over some lines if they yeah. like, kind of got clubby and stuff. So that makes you feel like that was really cool. Just like the whole experience of being on a film set, like we're doing, uh, like doing crazy like a Lynx. Uh, that one is, is so much different because it's like scripted. It's like reality show, right? Yeah. Like there's points to hit, but really it's like Don and I, Don Kelly, the freaking hilarious Don Kelly, just being clowns. We get to just like be ourselves and have lots of fun and make lots of jokes. Um, and then there's two cameras and the director and the producer usually hangs around too, just to make sure like what they, they see what's going on. Mm -hmm. But like a film set, it, there's like tens of people, um, and and it's like it all it all happens so fast. Like the movement happens so fast, and there's there's lights and there's there's other things that I don't understand. Like I'm just watching it all happen is is, uh, is really wild to see. And I was so nervous. Like the night before, my partner it was a, both a big first for us. It was his first time working as a journeyman electrician, completely on his own, and it was my first time being on a film set. Completely, like I have no idea what I'm doing. Completely new people. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anyone here. Uh, so I was so scared. We were both just like clinging to each other like the whole night, just like anxiety ridden. <laughs> I don't even know if we slept much. Just scared. Um, and the next day, like I remember just being like, "Okay, you got this." And I like screwed up. Like just like day one first scene I still had gel nails I thought they were like I thought they were going to come off easier mm -hmm. uh, like your gel, the gel po polish sorry uh, and it did not so we I must have wasted them like half an hour set them back half an hour that <laughs> first day <laughs> because we were trying to find the strong enough nail polish that would get this gel polish off and I was like oh my god I'm fired I know it I'm just fired so um but I was not uh, I was 20 more days of shooting uh, and it was just like it was lots of fun and learning how to do that was really special. Um, and I'm excited to like do more of that because I would love to, to do like workshops with youth um, here in Saskatchewan as well. Like I'm hoping that they bring back the tax credit soon because like, I don't know, it'd be nice to not have to leave this province, you know? Yeah, well, and I know that there was a petition for that return and I think there was about 3,500 signatures so far. You know, and considering how we're in these days, I think it would be, you know, bring it back would be a great time now. Yeah, like I, I really do think, like I, I don't, I think at this point by just, by not doing it, they're just, it's just trying to be stubborn. It's just egos in the way, um, which is really unfortunate because yeah, like as a province, like especially now, um, a lot of production companies are, have figured out ways to make sure that they're doing production safely, you know, that they're shooting safely. Uh, because we're watching more TV than ever right now. Like we probably will be for the next two years, especially like until the vaccine comes up for coronavirus, you know? So mm -hmm. um, I think it's, uh, I think it'd be silly for the problem to not, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? To not re, I don't know. Bring to it not back. Switch up, to not, yeah, yeah. What'd you say? Bring it back, but Ed says reinvest. So yeah, yes, not reinvest, yeah, to, yeah. Oh, well, I have that word somewhere. It's kicking around my brain. But yeah, to, well, yeah, to have the promise just, yeah, to have a redo mulligan and start it up again. Because <laughs> um, yeah, like there's, I don't know, I think that the, I think it's time for Saskatchewan to, to have a, a but, um, blossoming films industry as well. Because our theater scene is so, is so spectacular. And, and our comedy scene here in Saskatoon has really blown up over the past couple of years as well. Um, and I, I think we have probably... The, the scene with the, the most indigenous um, stand-up comedians. I, I'm, I'd, I'd wager a bet that we, we do actually, I think we do, uh, which is awesome because 
we're so freaking funny. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, I really are. Like uh, be before, you know, they had closed down things. I had gone to some of the the comedies and I was like seeing a lineup of indigenous comedians. And I, I was laughing, even if it's something like of a similar joke, just the way it's told and personalized with your own story is just like, I think that's the only time I feel like my stomach is getting a good workout is just from laughing so hard. Yeah. Yeah. I find like my cheeks hurt after a night where I'm just like, Hey, like I gotta chill. Um, but it's really fun. Like, and, and, and getting started in comedy too. Like I was, uh, I always wanted to be a comedian. Yeah. I mentioned that. And like, I, I didn't know how though. And then I moved here. Um, and there was, there was like a room that people would go to do comedy in, uh, but the showrunner, at the time he wasn't well liked like now he's i don't know he's made his amends um and and what have you but at the time like i i just heard some really really not cool things um and so i was like well i don't know if i want to do it you know like i was kind of chickening out before i even started it um and then <clears throat> um one day oh i think this goes yeah so then even with my, my youtube series too dakota tries which is why we named it dakota tries a lecture i have this dork youtube series you go to tries um and then part of like wanting to do comedy and parting part of wanting to start my own youtube channel is like i i was really like i just knew i wanted to entertain people and at least like doing that like with the youtube and stand up would be stuff that i could, could like have more control over because it's stuff that i'm <laughs> writing or that i'm putting out into the world you know uh it's different than acting for that reason um but uh there was this, this fella i was dating at the time <laughs> He had said, like, uh, but don't you have to be funny, Dakota? <laughs> Something like that. Aww. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> you know? And then uh, we had uh, parted ways. And I was like, you know what? Like, I am funny. <laughs> I, I can do this. You and that's are. When I, well, that's when I shot my first Dakota Tries uh, Brazilian Wax, which at the time, like, it was the most views I'd ever got in my life. And it was like 5,000 views or something like that in a, in a short amount of time. And I was like, oh, see, like, but really, it's a Brazilian wax. Like, of course, people are going to tune in. There's going to be lots of creeps on YouTube. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> that happen. Back yeah. to that, people are not just there to be genuine fans. So, um, <laughs> but that was that. And then for the stand up, like, I just, I decided I'd go out to Woods Ale House one night and just give it a try, um, which was, really uncomfortable for everyone in that building I think because I was not good I just hijacked the microphone from like tonight is poetry I'm pretty sure and then just talked about getting an IUD for 17 minutes and it was very awful and uncomfortable <laughs> I'm sure. but that was my that was it I, I think I got three laughs in that three genuine laughs and uh that's all I needed um and then just tried to find comedy wherever I could um I, what, part of my luck um, is doing theater for young audiences and stand-up comedy worked really well hand in hand because whenever I was on the road, <clears throat> I could look ahead to where we were going to be and, and see where those, like, if there was any open mics in the city. And so what would end up happening is, you know, you're up at six, uh, you're at the school at like, you know, 7.30ish setting up for an 8.30 or nine o'clock show. And you do two shows a day, you're done by three o'clock or four o'clock, you know? Mm -hmm. um and then stand-up starts you know sometimes you, sh you go up there at 7 30 or 8 it just depends so uh I found I was able to take a nap and have a supper and then go do some stand-up and and all these different communities so um I was able to get better as I was traveling um and and, and also like being able to network with lots of people I was doing a show and I was out in Kelowna for like three weeks and so um I really love that scene. David Kopp is a comedian uh, and showrunner out there. And he, he, he runs a really great, really great show, really great comedy scene out there. Um, and, and it was my first time in Vancouver. One time I was doing comedy in Vancouver. It was horrifying. I still wasn't like funny and like good at that point. I was mm -hmm. funny, but not good. I think that's, yeah, what the difference is. Um, but uh, it was so nice to like see, like make friends out there and, um, and, you know, in Ontario, like there was, uh, lots of friends that I made when we were, I traveled out, I got brave and tried out one, one mic, I think. Um, and because of that, I, that was the summer, I think I decided, um, I was, I moved to Toronto. I moved to Toronto to pursue stand up for, um, for some, for a few months. 
Um, that was actually just after I had my first ever TV. I got uh, Aboriginal Day Live in 2016. I was selected to be their social media host. Um, and that was through an online competition. They were asking people to submit if you thought you deserved to be an online, the, the social media host. <clears throat> um, so I, I put together this uh, the dorky video. We were at that time, I think we we're in Fort St. John, DC. And I needed to do this video. And, and so I, I asked the front desk if I could borrow their breakfast room <laughs> so I could shoot something. <laughs> and the guy was like, kind of just gave me this weird look. And I'm like, I promise I won't like eat anything or steal your peanut butters. Like I'm not, <laughs> I just want to use it to shoot quietly because I don't want to annoy my castmates. Um, so I had done that, shot what I needed to shoot, made some ch cheesy jokes and uh, started learning how to edit, edit on my laptop and edit on my phone. At that time, I think it was just my laptop. So, um, but like, that's a skill that I've, I've been slowly developing as well. I don't know. Like, it's just, it's just crazy how everything kind of just starts to hold hands, you know, like, it's like, oh yeah, like one skill begets another, begets another. And then pretty soon you're pretty soon. Yeah. You're I'm sitting here talking for 45 minutes about um, what you've got, what you, where you've gone, what you've done. So yeah, no, it's been quite interesting, you know, and um, like, so what has been your now that you've kind of like been at the the comedy game what what is your process like you for, know these shows for, that, for for putting show for doing shows yeah for like putting your 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 process for your comedy for my comedy um i need to develop a better process this one's not cutting it for me <laughs> um usually what happens is like before i do an open mic um, I'll sit down and I'll think about everything that happened that week or I'll go through my phone because I'm really when something funny happens or when I think of something funny I immediately put it in, my, in a note on my phone um, and that's because it, I have no excuse like if I don't have pen and paper right I prefer pen and paper but phone is just there so I'll, I'll go through everything I'll write down my notes for um, like jokes or things that I want to talk about that week um, and then if something gets a laugh I do a check mark if something doesn't it's an x or something like yeah like there's room like i'll do like a little squiggly thing uh and then after that i kind of go through like i hold on to that and the next week i go through things and so whatever got a check mark i get try to like expand on and, and like see how i can make that funnier uh mm -hmm. <clears throat> but then like before shows um and my my partner he's he's a stand-up comedian as well and so is his twin and his twin's girlfriend so we usually do uh comedy shows the four of us um and I have this this uh, awful habit of like like five minutes before the show's starting, I'm just like, uh, I quit. I quit after this. I'm not funny. I don't know why I'm here. This is I'm just gonna embarrass myself. I'm gonna embarrass you. I'm gonna embarrass everybody. Everyone's gonna cringe. I hate this. Blah blah blah. And then I go on stage, make people laugh, and I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> I like this. Uh, so I realize I have to change that. I have to change that because otherwise I just berate myself for five minutes, and then I go on stage and I'm just like <laughs> nervous. Uh, so imposter syndrome. Yeah, that's totally it. Like, I just, I feel like it's, I'm, I'm totally not, not a comedian. I feel like, yeah, it's such a fraud being like, oh yeah, no, I'm, this is what I do. This is what I do for fun. Um, so that's something I need to, I need to sort through because I am a comedian and, and I know like I'm, I'm helping up the scene too in ways like, uh, there's a comedian in Edmonton who started these backyard fire, like backyard comedy shows. Um, and we haven't done comedy here in, in months. So uh, we started, I started putting together fire pit funnies uh, and that's so people can basically dial a comedian. You know, we, you get to pick your comedians, what kind of style of com comedy you'd like. Um, and, uh, and we get to show up. All right, so we have here, what advice would you have for a young up and coming indigenous theater artist in Saskatchewan, the same for comedy. Okay, for young, what advice? <clears throat> um, I would say, yeah, make make sure your your monologues are 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 tight and always memorize, uh, and practice them, freshen them up every now and then, um, and like and always kind of be on the lookout for for other monologues too. Like I think having really like a unique monologue is really fun. Um, uh, my my monologues are uh, it's uh, one from Vi Twelfth Night or So Be It, one of Viola's monologues. It's one of my favorites, uh, and uh, Isabel's monologue from the beginning of uh, Dreary and Izzy by Tara Bacon. Uh, those are my two monologues that I go to. Um, and uh, and I usually have them in my back pocket at any time. There's been times when I've been at a party and I just start throwing up my Shakespeare. And that's when you know it's time for me to go home. Um, but that's, <laughs> uh, and then also just um, be, be, don't be afraid to go out and meet your community. Um, and don't be afraid 
uh, to don't give yourself boundaries. I think that's something that really um, helped me. I didn't know that there was any theater boundaries. Like Neil Foster is probably one of Cat. Is it, is it Neil Foster? No, I'm panicking about the name, but uh, is one of Canada's play. I guess good like famous playwrights. Uh, and I just emailed him and asked if I could read some of his plays um, for to look for monologues. And his publicist gave like emailed me back four plays that I asked for and said, "Hey, thanks for thinking of me. <laughs> thanks for thinking of him." And I was like, "Oh, sweet, that's that's really cool." And one of my friends was like, "You just emailed him?" <laughs> so, like, you you can't put boundaries on on yourself or on anything. And and yeah, you know, if, if there's theaters that you know you you want to audition for, just send your, their information. If there's theaters in Germany, in Norway, in the States, in Australia, I mean, maybe not so much now, but uh, you can still reach out to them and maybe make uh, create a relationship um, because especially as indigenous uh, like creators or, or our theater artists, I think that our, our art's gonna be um, really, really in demand in the, next, in the next coming years. And so I think fostering relationships with whoever you want to uh, is, is really special and really important. Um, I think that's that. For comedy, <clears throat> I would say, I mean, really, you just got to bite the bullet and you just got to go. You got to come up to an open mic. Um, if you join YXC Comedy Community, that's where you can see when we have open mics uh, and shows and stuff listed. Um, you just got to you just gotta start doing it. It's one of those things where it's like, it's going to feel like you're ripping a bandaid off, if, especially if you've never done comedy before. But once you do it, you're going to be like, oh, this is, this is awesome. Um, and then like eventually you can decide if you're going to be more of a hobbyist or if you're going to get to be like a true comedian. Uh, I haven't decided yet. I've been doing it for like five years now. Um, I feel like I'm more on the hobbyist side, but I also am not because like I do, I do love comedy and, and I do, uh, do do it for money and I do want an album and I do <laughs> want <laughs> all of this. So um, I think just, just coming out to mics, um, get to know your Get to know the other comedians get to know your scene that's like really important we're really uh, fortunate here in saskatoon and that our scene is really small uh so we're pretty tight-knit and and we're all very friendly um i like to host charcuterie nights for the comedians uh, although now it's different um so it's just it's lots of fun uh also <clears throat> i think in both instances you have to be somewhat fearless in calling out injustices uh, which is a lot easier said than done. Like now, this is just the first year and I'm starting to get a little more bolder and mm -hmm. when um, things are, I, I feel unfair or yeah. hurtful. Um, so, and it's taken me like, in, I'm in theater now for, for professionally se seven years, coming up eight years. Uh, it's taken me this song to finally be like, yeah, you know what? Like I'm, I need to know, like I need to let people know when something's crossed the line. Uh, and in comedy, like, I think comedy is so much different than, the, like, it is so much different than theater, but at least, like, it's just, like, your your jobs don't necessarily depend on other comedians, you know what I mean? Whereas, like, mm -hmm. if you're telling, a, you know, someone in the arts industry and in, in theater, if, you, if you've been offended by them, they might be offended that you were offended and <laughs> you might not have a job, you know what I mean? So, yeah, <clears throat> um, that whole chestnut. Uh, but, yeah, whereas in comedy, like, yeah, like, you just have to be, I mean, there, there are so, there are, there's lots, there's a lot more uh, psychos in comedy, and I know that's not very PC, but it's because it's true. There's a lot more psychos in comedy, uh, scary people. I think a lot of comedians, like or open micers rather, is what we call them, uh, use open mics as a, uh, a method of therapy, uh, mm -hmm. which is uncomfortable for everyone in the room, and that's just just don't do that. <laughs> I guess that's my <laughs> advice. If you need therapy, that's great. Get therapy. I'm seeking it out too, um, but definitely it's, uh, it's, it is uncomfortable. Um, and for, for comedy, take special note. Um, if you are inclined to have any kinds of addictions issues or what have you, um, substance and alcohol abuse runs rampant in the comedy scene. I think everybody, like everybody kind of knows that or assumes it. Uh, you just have to take special precautions because that's something like it's easy to get caught up in. You're doing open mics, you know, and um, most comedy shows are at bars these days you know there's and even at, at comedy clubs if you do clubs it's like two drink minimums kind of thing so yeah. you find yourself having a pint or two every night or like one show a night and then if you're doing three shows and it's three shows a night you know what I mean or three shows a week so it's like that's something that I think we have to be uh take precaution of and especially because we're indigenous because people are going to look at us like that you know what I mean so we have to I think that's kind of that's my advice for that uh that's those are really good questions um yeah <laughs>
I feel like I'm just like I'm just like blah, 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 blah. I hope it all I hope this makes sense and it's like it's good. <laughs> yes, no, we really enjoy having you and trying this out and getting to know yeah more about your your journey because I know I've you know seen you grow since to the the COB because that's when we first uh, met. I pop by like here's our first mentee artist. So to kind of see how far you've come this way and uh, tackling the different areas of the artistic community. And then seeing your developing skills as a comedy person, and I know that's you know definitely something that's uh, awesome and scary, and you know, and I, I want to know what what do you do for yourself when you have those uh, shows, you know, like the ones that are pretty pretty tough. Oh, like when I have tough rooms, like when I have yeah tough crowds. Yeah, and you're reassessing afterwards, just so you know. What do you do for that time to keep yourself uh, going and not just drop comedy altogether? Oh yeah, so that's really um, those are those are instances where I know that I'm doing something wrong because I know that like my comedy is very funny and I and I have I know how to like you know have fun with the audiences. I treat the audiences like they're my best friends. So I know I've done something wrong either in the sense of like I know that I did not make them feel like they were my friend because that's like how I try to make audiences feel that we're we're, we're in it together, you know, um, or. Uh, they're just not my demographic and that happens you know like I know first for a fact I would not be funny to a room full of uh, cis, gen cis male uh, older white conservative men they they're just not gonna get my humor at all <laughs> so uh, some of those rooms I just know that I, there's no there's no way I'm gonna be funny uh, so I look at it as just practicing my time and uh, learning it what like having a tight five is uh, without any laughter <laughs> so um, that's just how I look at it. It's, it's bombing with grace is how I try to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, but something I wanted to touch on too, like for um, indigenous, young indigenous artists who are um, looking, aspiring to be you know, in theater and or comedy and or film and or what have you, um, there's going to be so many times when you're scared. Like, I think I get scared at least like from, from ev like every opportunity. There's something I find very fearful and very scary in it. Um, but part of developing your comfort zone. Like it's called a comfort zone for a reason because it feels nice to be in. This is my zone, I'm comfortable in it. But if you want to, to, to grow or expand your skill sets and uh, your abilities, you have to push, you have to reach out of that comfort zone. So I think reaching out little by little is, is, a, is a great way to develop a, a larger comfort zone. Um, and it's okay to be scared, but you have to learn, yeah, you have to have other healthy coping mechanisms um, have good people to talk to when you're scared that you trust uh, because it is, it, I mean, the arts is scary. And the thing about art is it's so subjective. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can have one person telling you this was an amazing play or this is wonderful what you wrote or how you directed it or this this comedy set absolutely killed me. And on the same hand, you can have someone blogging about how absolute garbage it was. So um, <clears throat> those are things you do have to take with a grain of salt uh, and and just be prepared for it. Um, my YouTube channel has been really uh, helping me uh, develop thicker skin for when strangers say mean slash really weird things about me. So um, I, I suggest even getting one of those because then you can practice doing your stand up, you can practice doing your, your, your art, uh, and you can practice being vulnerable because I think that's something that when you do this, uh, when you put yourself out there in so many avenues, you really do have to practice being vulnerable and being not so afraid of it, um, especially when you're offering something that you've written that you're trying to make funny to, to the world. Um, yeah, so get one of those actually, get a YouTube channel. And you can make it private, you can make it enlisted, but uh, eventually you're gonna have to make it public just so that you can start getting getting views and this. Hi, question, do you have any new projects in the works or anything you want to do in the future? Yes, Kay, I'm trying to figure out how I can say stuff without getting in trouble um okay so crazy lake of links is on aptn uh, i'm co-hosting that with the awesome john kelly uh and it's it's really fun um what can i say how can i i'm i'm being looked at to host a couple other shows and so i'm my fingers are crossed um for for those i'm just we're just kind of it's a waiting game right now Mm -hmm. um another thing is uh there's a tv show that i've been kind of working on as a writer myself for the past um i guess like year and some um <clears throat> and um 
a streaming site has uh, expressed interest in it. Um, and so now I'm working on my first ever Bible TV show, TV series, Bible and pilots. And I'm dying, you guys. I'm like, ah, I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, please green light it, my God. So, uh, so I'm working on that right now. Uh, and, and that's what I'm hoping to have um, uh, shot here in Saskatchewan, in Saskatoon. And there's another series that me and another producer were working together with on that we're aiming to have shot here in Saskatoon as well. And we're just so hellbent and stubborn that I think we're just going to anyways, and we're just going to make the government feel really bad about all the money that they could have been making. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to bully the government. No, I'm not. I'm, I might, but um, <laughs> there'll be lots of like Facebook lives talking about how, oh, would it be so cool if this paycheck was invested back in the economy? Um, but uh, but yeah, so that's, that's those projects that I have. Um, I've got like, right now, I just need um, discipline. I need to work on my self-discipline for my writing because I really want to, I really want to put out a comedy album um, in the next com coming years. Uh, so part of that though, is I want to make sure that I have enough stand-up material to, to use after I, I launch it. Cause I don't want to just be like, Hey, here's all my jokes that I've been working on. And now I don't have anything <laughs> to tell <laughs> the world. Right. Which is like, it's just a matter of sitting down and writing uh, and then writing for my, the plays that I've, that I've had ideas for, for years. Um, like, I really want to write this play. Um, it's, it's kind of like an opera uh, based on this, this this girl and and this young woman and, and her relationship with with death and, and how they long to be with each other, but they can't because he's uh, he's death. <laughs> so um, I want to write an opera about that. And uh, I, I want to write, you know what? And I don't know if uh, Gerard Way would ever say yes to it, but I want to make my musical based on Black Parade. <laughs> on Black Parade. So uh, it's just lots of writing and, uh, putting my nose to the grindstone and, and creating that self-discipline. I think that's other, that's also important for uh, a, a blossoming artist to have is self-discipline. That was Ugh. fantastic. I can't believe how long we chatted. About I know. That. Oh my God. I feel like I just like talked your ears off and talked everyone's ears off. And I'm like so self-conscious right now. I'm so sweaty also right now. Talking's, talking's hard. Oh, it, is warm. it is warm outside. That's so. true. I do have a scarf on. I just did it for fashion and to feel comfortable. <laughs> if we, uh, if there was a place you wanted to do your comedy, like what is your dream spot to, if, even if it's not like right now, but somewhere down the line that you would like to take a stab at? Yeah, um, I think doing the teacup there. Yeah, TCU place is too too big for me. Like I watched Bill Bird do a set there. And it was, it's like, I'm sure that'd be phenomenal to hear that many laughs, but I'm much more of like a cozy, intimate person. Like I want to see my audience members, um, the underdog uh, in at Edmonton, they have a really great little room where they do comedy. And I think, I just think being like, what I, the place I want to be with comedy is, is headlining. I want to be a true headliner. I want to have my tight 45, 50 minutes to an hour. Uh, and I, I want people, yeah, to like have to leave, like being like, oh my gosh, that's where I want to be uh, in terms of comedy. That's that's what I'm working towards. And and then, yeah, having an album. Um, I'm really excited. I think my merch, and I think for my merch, I'm going to do fanny packs and cool stickers. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, maybe some Go Girls. Just kidding. Go I'm not really <laughs> that. <I'm lying. laughs> That'd be fun for after the bar. Hey, you just see like, like after a comedy show, there's just like, six six women trying to use it outside just awfully though i would not recommend it try it at home first <laughs> <laughs> no for sure um a couple quick questions before we wrap up a little bit what's yeah. the longest set that you've uh you've done so far for comedy like be beating your personal best uh 45 minutes and that was years ago oh my gosh i think i was just panicking because i had literally okay so that was for it was a lady bits show uh, so it was myself and Don Dumont were in the first half, uh, and then the second half was going to be all improv. Um, but I don't think, I think there was like this miscommunication, because I think Don thought it was like an open mic type of thing, or like she just had like five minutes prepared, and Jenny Ryan was like, oh my gosh, like, hey, like, you just need to like tell all the jokes that you can, and I was like, hey, but I'd written down two things <laughs> on my paper. Cause I thought like, oh, it was just such, such a, such a misfire. Like I thought I was opening for John and I don't know. It was just like such a co confusing time. Um, but I pulled 45 minutes out of my butt and my best friend, like he was like, 
Like, it was so funny, like, watching people, like, I wish I recorded it. <laughs> like, I didn't know I had 45 minutes. Like, it was so much fun. There was so much laughter and, and like, like, gentle roasting and playing with the audience and, like, crowd work. And, oh, it was, like, so fun. Um, and so, and that was years ago. And I'm trying to work my way back to that, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Part of, part of, yeah, like, that's that. So that was that. Like, right now, I don't. Right now, I like second guessing myself. It's that imposter syndrome. Like, I'm like, oh, I just have 12 minutes when I like, I know I've like gone through my notes and my jokes, and I know I, I'm like, I'm rounding 30 to 35 if I just put in my freaking work. So um, that's kind of where it's kind of, yeah, that's, that's my time. <laughs> okay. Well, Dakota, I want to thank you so much for, for joining us, being our first. Dakota tries a lecture series. Yay! Thank you so much for having me. And um, if there are those, yeah, like if you have, if there are people that have any more questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me, Dakota Ray Hebert, on my Facebook. Um, I try to answer messages as best as I can. Uh, but yeah, you can ask me questions there, and then uh, that'd be great. Thank you so much, Dakota. Thank and you for, yes, awesome. And. For everyone that's out there watching and listening, uh, keep an eye out for on our Facebook uh, page or social media as we are presenting our first online digital reading of our Playhouse series. You could join us next Friday for our first uh, read. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to send them our way. Thank you all again for joining us and Dakota. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.